Great. Okay, so um, with handicap systems, we are taking as a leap of faith that regardless of how many boat types you have and boats you have, you have a system that can fairly rate those boats. So that way everybody has a fair chance at success. Um, I use this slide. Anybody know where this is from? It's not far from where you've been, Alice. It's from, uh, it's Trieste. It's, uh, it's called the Barcelona. It's this amazing event they have with a thousand boats. Yes, 1,000 boats. It's, uh, it's, it looks a little chaotic, doesn't it? But it's, it's immensely popular. Um, and in theory, it doesn't matter how many boats or boat types, if you have a system that's robust, you can uh, give everybody a fair chance of racing. Um, is it realistic? Well, it is if everybody believes it. If everybody believes the system is treating their boat fairly, along with those of their competitors, then, then you have this kind of inherent principle that everybody has a chance to win. Uh, this, this is a list of topics that I plan to get through in the next 30 minutes or so uh, to allow then uh, time for questions. We're gonna start off with ORC principles. What does that mean? Um, because not every handicap system has the same principles. Our, ours are the following. Transparency. We're very uh, focused on publishing everything we do and we have. Uh, all the rules are published online. You can get it, all the certificate, all the certificate, in fact, every certificate issued by ORC since 2009 in any country, is available on the sailor services portion of the ORC website. Um, and that's, I think it's 150,000 measurement records. It's pretty amazing resource. Um, mostly, and it's a huge variety of boat types from all over the world. But the point is that, that you can get at that if you wanna meddle a little bit in, in how the rating system works and and, what, and running test certificates. You don't have to do that through the rating office. You can do it yourself. This is an online uh, self-service portal for our system. And we're really proud of that because it took a long time to get it, pro get it uh, programmed. Uh, but our, our team is really good at this. Uh, so it continually updates uh, as new certificates are issued by the 42 rating office, sorry, 32, 35, something like that. We have a lot of rating offices around the world. Um, and everything that they do and all the certificates that they issue get uploaded automatically. And you all can get access to it if you like. And test certificates are not hundreds of dollars or euros, they're 15. <laughs> so it's quite an accessible system, both financially and, and functionally. Uh, science, everything that is in an ORC certificate or an ORC rating is not random. It is based on science. It's based on hydrodynamic and aerodynamic research, uh, along with calibrations of how that works. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, our process is also inclusive. It's not a bunch of uh, guys with, in a smoke-filled room. Uh, there is a process that we have for getting uh, feedback and using that feedback to improve the system every year. Uh, we're, we're lucky to have one of four ORC congressmen uh, based here in Chicago. That's Matt Gallagher. And Matt got to see this in action last uh, November at our annual meeting in, uh, in Italy. Uh, and it's committee meetings. It's a lot of hard work. It's reports. It's going through the submission process. So different countries are, are, have a process where they can asks the system to improve with very specific uh, recommendations. Um, it's, a, it's a process, it's a parliamentary process too. That's why we're called the Offshore Racing Congress. Now we're large enough in the number of certificates that we issue here in the States, uh, along with having one legacy seat to have four congressmen. The number of congressmen is proportional to the number of certificates issued in that country. So the US has been coming up in prominence. It was actually, Early on, one of the founders of this system, turns out, um, we're not a new organization. We've been around since 1969, so over 50 years. Uh, 
and therefore we have built up a tremendous amount of experience and expertise in the business, and it is a business, uh, of rating, uh, fairly rating uh, offshore, offshore oriented sailboats. Now we also do sport boats and we also do uh, super yachts. And we also this year started to do multi-hulls. So using the same principles, we're actually able to, to address the handicapping needs of a huge variety of different, different boat types. Um, and then professionalism. We are large enough in, what did I, what was it? Fort, Matt, 14,000 certificates ORC issued around the world in 42 countries last year. Um, we, we take a levy off of each of those certificates issued. There's a retail price that's charged by the rating offices and then we take a levy from, from different types. So our annual budget is quite robust. Uh, we're, we're, we are a uh, non-profit company registered in the UK. Uh, so our sole dedication is toward servicing the needs of you all as racing sailors and doing it through our process. Uh, we invest heavily in science and our technical committee and the research tools they need. We invest in, in uh, things like this, education and outreach. We have lots of, of different resources uh, to, to educate folks on how the system works. But point is we have a full-time professional staff and that's programmers and technical people along with uh, ministers of propaganda like myself. Um, so it is not a volunteer effort. <laughs> and what that means is we have high standards and we are, answer, uh, we are uh, responsive and, uh, and, and professional in our approach. So how do these ratings work? Is it process like that? Um, and the answer, of course, is no. <laughs> we don't have subjective elements and dart throws in how we do ratings. If we can't scientifically model what, uh, what's going on with a boat and its performance, it's not included in the rule. So an example of this is a, a very fine fellow uh, from Northern Michigan who has a Beneteau 53 and, and uh, he's a great guy and he gets, he gets all this, but he says, I, I've got a bow thruster with a tunnel in it. That can't be fast. You know, how does ORC address that? And I tell him every year, uh, you know, we need the technical committee to address this. He's, well, can't you just give me three seconds a mile? I, no, <laughs> we can't. We're not, we don't do arbitrary things like that. Um, it, uh, we have a, I think we have a solution. In fact, I just learned a week or two ago that there may be a solution for him and his Beneteau 53 because uh, in super yachts, which is another segment of our business, uh, those guys have, bow thrusters and stern thrusters. I mean, these are boats over 100 feet. They've got all kinds of things that are modeled in the super yacht rules. So maybe we can borrow from that to help improve um, the rule for boats that we all sail here. Uh, point is that it, it takes modeling and it takes uh, effort to do things properly and we take that effort. All right, what is a VPP? What is a vol velocity prediction program? Um, basically, you have to think a little bit from your high school physics, sorry, uh, but it's a force balance equation. So you've got drive forces from the sails balance against the drag forces from the uh, hydrodynamic drag from the hull and the appendages. We've got a uh, healing force that's balanced against a stability force. A healing force, of course, comes from the, from the sails uh, and windage and the, the uh, gravity is the stability force. What's, what's in your keel, what's in your water ballast, what's in the bulb, all that stuff gets measured and evaluated to, uh, to come up with a solution and a model of performance using this velocity prediction program. What does that look like? Well, it looks like a bunch of equations. Those are only a few, <laughs> but we document everything in that, in that uh, principle of transparency we have the VPP documentation is one of our uh, rule books and it lays out what all these uh, assumptions are in the modeling and the equations that are used to, to, uh, to devise that model. Um, it's pretty, in fact, <laughs> if you don't like reading all the equations, 
you can actually get a copy of the VPP yourself. You can buy it, runs on a PC. So we, we do everything we can to be as transparent as possible with our, our system. Um, how is that used? I mean, because that all sounds very theoretical, doesn't it? Okay, our, our hydro model is this, our aero model is this. How do, you know, there's certainly there are gonna be things that uh, are not exactly modeled because nature, <laughs> like most things is not perfect. Uh, trying to model sailboats and their complex performance is not easy. So we have another process that uh, what, what you're seeing here is a, is a plot, a polar performance plot. And all those dots represent um, boats that have had, uh, had their performance evaluated from real world instruments. So we, we have a feedback loop where one of the members on our technical committee, Rob Ronzenbach, incredibly smart aerodynamicist, used to uh, run the Glen L. Martin wind tunnel at University of Maryland and has been doing America's Cup work. And he was, a, he was the aerodynamic expert with quantum sails for a long time. And what, what he's tasked with is getting uh, instrument logs from boats that are target boat types that we need to know more about. Um, so, and his criteria is very strict. As you can imagine, those of you that have instruments, man, it's, it's, it's hard, isn't it? They gotta be calibrated. You gotta have some confidence that it's correct. We got it. He, so he takes the raw instrument logs. We actually wash it through a process where we filter out the noise and get the good data from it. Um, and then that's used to help calibrate the VPP. I call it sausage, scientific sausage making, right? Because you've got, you've got uh, a, lot of, a lot of good material from the VPP, but you need to, if you really want to calibrate this and get it to where your customers are confident that this makes sense, uh, you need this calibration routine as well. So this is a big part of what our technical committee uh, does. Um, and it, it's not an easy process. And one key to that process, though, is the boat types have to have ORCI certificates. We want the highest quality data possible. So boats that are fully measured, that are, they don't have to be high performance boats, but they have to have uh, reasonable, incredible data. Um, first of all, they got to be in our database. So these boats, and this is a plot, by the way, uh, of the sorts of analysis that our technical committee used. Those up front can see all the little uh, circles and triangles um, that represent boats of different types. And they're plotted here, evaluating a best fit residuary resistance from the hydro model uh, against a depowering model that was used this year, it was refined. Uh, and this is uh, the, the horizontal axis is boat displacement. So as you can see, there's many hundreds uh, of plots here uh, representing the ORCI fleet, which is composed of boats of every boat type that is issued an ORCI certificate. And I think, I'm thinking it's about 1200 actually. Does that sound right, Matt? So somewhere in that, it's, it's, it's an amazing variety of boat types um, across that, that, that you may not see the horizontal scale, but it's from uh, 2000 kilos, so two tons on the left, all the way to 16 tons on the right. Now, these boats that are way up here um, are outliers. And what are they? They're sleds, ULDB sleds. They didn't have very good ratings in ORC uh, for the last couple of years because I only just got those guys to get ORCI certificates. Now they're in the rate; they're on the radar, and they can be properly evaluated using the ORC technical committee's tools to get them fair ratings. Uh, so that's in a group up to the upper right, and then the other one in the middle to point out is Viva is a Cal 40. So here in America, we've got a lot of interesting and unusual and mostly old designs that do not exist in the fleets in Europe or elsewhere. So these are unique challenges for the te technical committee to use their tools to get them fair ratings. And uh, guess what? <laughs> Those guys got significantly better ratings this year because finally they're able to be evaluated. 
you think about those boats, they're pretty darn unusual, right? They're long and they're narrow and they're tippy and masthead rigs. I mean, uh, the, the, those boats really don't exist elsewhere. Uh, they were, they were uh, you know, developed and designed in the 1980s. So a, a while ago. Anyway, um, so that's just an example of how this process works. Uh, how much are those guys getting? I think when I looked at some tests, they're getting like 20 seconds a mile in GPH. Who wouldn't want that, right? But again, we're, we're, we're perfectly happy with that because they've been through all the, <clears throat> all the test screens uh, to evaluate them properly. And, and that, that comes also from those guys having given their instrument logs to Rob Ronsenbach. So they're on the radar. Point being that we, we have a feedback loop for unusual boat types and therefore we're able to, uh, to get them um, more accurate ratings. I don't wanna say better, more accurate. All right, so from, in page one of, of all ORC certificates, whether they're club or ORCI, you have this uh, matrix here, it's, it's rated boat velocity. So that's the velocity in knots that the VPP thinks your boat should be doing uh, as a function of uh, wind angle and wind speed. So six to 20 knots in the columns and uh, the rows are wind angles from uh, uh, upwind VMG on the top to downwind VMG on the bottom. Uh, so those are, th that's what the VPP does is it creates rated speeds. So your rating is not a single number so much. It's a prediction of the rated speeds of your boat across a matrix of values. Now, the interesting part then comes what, what is your rating that's used in a race? It can't be, well, it could be a matrix of values if we use the most um, sophisticated scoring technique, but we're not in this culture there quite yet. We use that at the, at the world championships. Um, but here in the States, uh, race committees like to have um, course models that they use. They like to have single number uh, solutions for the rating. So it's not a complex matrix. And um, this is on page two of all ORC certificates issued in the US. So uh, in the middle of page two are all these different options. And we'll go through those in a moment. I just wanna point out in the red circle are even more options for this year compared to last year. Uh, the, uh, we've, we've added the uh, St. Francis Yacht Club Big Boat Series. Uh, to our suite of regattas that are using ORC ratings. And they have some specific course models they wanted. So we put it on certificates now. And then uh, just below it in the lower part of the red circle is a uh, new predominantly reaching model. We've had a predominantly upwind, a predominantly downwind. And then somebody pointed out uh, from the Fort Lauderdale to Key West race this year that, hey, it would be really good to have a reaching model because the upwind and the downwind don't quite fit. Well, all we needed to do was then confer with those who uh, had an interest in this and look at the wind angles and devise a new course matrix for predominantly reaching. Uh, and we publish all these. These are all published, not on the certificates, but the course models themselves uh, are published on the ORC page on the US sailing website. So again, transparency. It's uh, those, those who wanna, wanna know it uh, can find it. All right, what are the certificate options? Well, uh, club certificates are one option. Uh, those primarily use data that is declared or assumed. And what does that mean? That means the rating office knows more or less what you know, most Beneteau 36.7s, uh, what their characteristics are, displacement, riding moment, um, Sales, by the way, have to be uh, declared, have to be measured. And from people like Andy, you need to have hi him either measure your sales or provide the data for the, the sale measurements. And that's for every certificate type in the US. So a Beneteau 36.7 may have all the same data in its rig dimensions 
in its displacement, in its writing moment um, and stability, sorry, writing moment. Uh, but it could have a different rating because they have a different crew weight or they may have a different uh, set of sails and the sail dimensions are different. So, um, but the point is with club certificates, the rating office usually uh, takes control of what they think that boat type should be. Now, their criteria, by the way, is, uh, is whatever the fastest uh, and, and let's say least advantageous um, data will be of that boat type. And often for certain, certain manufacturers, some, some that begin with J, uh, they'll use uh, the published displacements from the builder. And everybody laughs, right? Because we know that the boats are not that light. However, without having measured your boat, what else is the rating office going to use as a benchmark? So builder specs are often uh, used for determining club certificate data. Sometimes they're close, like 36.7s, the guys in the far office in Veneto actually probably work together pretty closely because the, the builder specs are pretty darn close to what the boats measure to be. 40.7s too, I think. So it, it just depends. It's not universally true. Um, it depends on the, the builder and the, and the designer. Um, and then there's ORCI certificates. ORCI certificates are the gold standard. Yeah, uh, can you, is it relevant to this or? Uh, I think it's the, okay. The rating office will have thousands of data points. Trust me, they got, they got the same, they got access to the same database that we have plus their own. doesn't matter, but thousands of boat types. And if they don't have your boat type, then welcome to the world of measurement. Um, ORCI certificates, on the other hand, are, uh, they have to, that's the gold standard. Everything has to be measured, right? The rig, not just the sails, but uh, the rig, the free boards to determine the actual displacement of the boat, uh, an inclining test to determine the actual stability. And then another criteria that's been layered on uh, in the last couple of years, which is a, a highly um, reliable offset file. Uh, what is an offset file? I'll show you in a few minutes. Um, also other certificate types are non-spinnaker. So in Annapolis right now, they, it's not quite as cold as here. So they actually race in the winter in frostbiting, but non-spinnaker and ORC offers non-spinnaker certificates. And then they also offer double-handed certificates. So ones that uh, represent a boat with only a 170 kilo crew weight uh, with your option of whatever other sales you want on the certificate uh, while you're in double-handed mode. So, um, yeah. There's also ORC one design certificate. So if you have, there's 22 different one designs. If you have a FAR 30 that is still in one design class trim, it's possible to get a one design class certificate. You will not, not get a, a J105 one design class certificate from ORC. Why? Different weights for different boats. There's a huge variation in 105s. Now, that doesn't mean they can't, as a class, uh, agree on what a, a so-called one design J105 is for those guys that don't want to get measured. Uh, in fact, we did this with J35s as well for the Bayview race, um, is agree on what we think a standard certificate should be for that boat. But guess what? It will be the fastest possible <laughs> uh, rating of that boat type because that, that's, that's the most fair. Anybody else who gets measured turns out to be 99 times out of 100 slower because the boat is heavier than its design. Anyway, um, so that, that covers one design. Far 40s are the same. There's 22 different boat types. They're, they're on the website. Certificate design uh, for 23, that's the same as the last few years. There's four pages. Um, page one has a line drawing of the boat. That's the upper left, along with some basic boat information. 
page two I just discussed is to the uh, middle right. That's got all the different rating uh, and scoring options. Uh, page three is, is uh, middle on the lower tier. And that has more detailed uh, dimensions of the rig and the boat, freeboards if the boat's been measured, writing moment and so on. Uh, and then page four is the sail inventory. It's, it's the sail inventory uh, that, that you declare as being the largest of headsail, spinnaker, um, and, uh, and mainsail. You may have more of those sails, but these are the ones that you've declared you want to have on your certificate. Uh, what about code zeros? What about what we call headsail set flying? Those are required in our rules to be measured and put on the certificate if you plan to use them. What's the difference between a code zero and a headsail set flying? The mid girth is either under or over seventy five percent. So anything under is sorry. Which is oh, anything under seventy five percent is going to be a head sail set flying. Anything between seventy five and eighty five will be a code zero. Needs to be shown on a certificate, but they're entered differently. A spinnaker is any. Yep. Yes. Uh, understood. So the question was. What is a spinnaker? What is a code zero? Code, well, it depends on your parlance. Uh, some sailmakers have sold code zeros as being sales that have a minimum, have a 75% mid girth, or as Andy said, 75 to 85%. Um, some people understand, quote, code zeros as being less than 75% mid girth. But 75% and more are a, that sale is a spinnaker by definition. Code zeros are generally smaller, right, than A3s or A2s. No. You are less, less than 75%. It is not a spinnaker. It is a headsail set flying. And that needs to be met. If you're carrying it in your inventory and plan to use it, it has to be measured and it has to be declared. If it is a, the other kind of code zero, the one that I think of more often, then, that ha then that's a sale that's 75 to 85%, as Andy described. That also must be measured. And that also has to be on the certificate. Now, cruising boats sometimes don't have a larger spinnaker, right? They may, that code zero might be all they have. They don't have an A2, for example. Um, but regardless, those sales of those types have to be measured, uh, identified. Sometimes I get, you know, client, measurement clients that'll say, well, here's the, here are the dimensions for my code zero. And then you look at the girth and it's, it's a head sole. It's less than 75%. That sale needs to be remeasured as a head sole. So, yes, another question. Yes. Okay, so the question is, if we have an A3 that's 80% and we have a code zero that's 75% or 75.1%, uh, yes, those need to be measured and declared. Whether or not you have an A2 as well, something larger. At 85%, if it's smaller than your A2, I'm trying to get my head wrapped around that, that'd be an interesting sale. It seems we have a sale maker here who knows the rules. I think others should know the rules, right? Yeah, anything under 85% has to be declared. And guess what? Even if you have, yeah, all of them. Eighty-six percent doesn't have to be declared if it's unless it's your largest spinnaker. Okay, Claro, cool. All right, didn't mean to get sidetracked, but boy, that was good, huh? Everybody feel better? No, I mean truly, this 
this is confusing and, and uh, even some sale makers don't know this. So uh, this is what page one looks like. And this is a cool page one, because look at that boat, that's a Volvo 70. It's got all the appendages on the cartoon. We want, we are, <laughs> we're trying to get agreement from our uh, naval architects in our technical committee to agree to have appendages drawn because we have the we have the data for it, uh, have them drawn for all ORC certificates, but some are uh, concerned about their intellectual property and what can be. <laughs> Alice is smiling. She said, "They could. What are they concerned about? They could just go over to Crowley's and anybody can grab anything." <laughs> but anyway, we we have to defer to the expertise and concerns of our technical committee. We would love to have them for all boats. And the reason is because there's huge variations, right? How many people have boats with shoal draft keels? Matt does, you do. Yeah, those are very different than ones with standard keels. And at a glance with a cartoon, you could quickly see that. And therefore rationalize, well, why are those guys so much slower in their rating? Well, because they have a different keel type. Anyway, a picture's worth a thousand words. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out here is this thing, what APH, APH has a prominent position on page one of all ORC certificates. Um, it's not anything you have to worry about this year, but next year that will be replacing GPH. We're phasing, phasing in the APH. It's all purpose handicap. It's a slightly different formulation than GPH, there's not gonna be any winners or losers when the switch is made uh, effective, this, effective next year, um, but just a heads up. And it turns out that that's about 50 seconds per mile faster than GPH. It's just a different formulation that we feel is, is a little more representative. And it also can be used as a scoring tool if needed. Question in the back. Can I, can I come back to that when I get to the, toward the end in the scoring? Yes, yeah. please, thank you. Um, right, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff, propeller types and crew weight, sail limitations. There's a lot of info, information on page one of ORC certificates. Um, the big one though that, that gets everyone is this one, page two. Why are there so many different scoring options, you know? Well, the reason is, as you can imagine, because we have boat types that are different and they behave in a nonlinear fashion, depending on what the wind speed and the course geometry is. So this plot, for those that you can see it, uh, is a Beneteau 40.7 in red or orange. The, the scale, vertical scale is boat speed expressed in seconds per mile. So slower, slower at the top, faster at the bottom. And then the horizontal scale is the true wind speed in knots. So as the wind speed goes up, boat goes faster. But between a far 30, which is the blue plot, and a 40.7, um, they behave quite differently. That, I mean, to me, that just seems, makes sense, right? If you use the single number system, however, how would you possibly characterize that? Knowing that they perform differently in different wind speed ranges. Now, some cultures would say, well, just choose one in the middle and every dog will have its day, <laughs> right? That's kind of a PHRF approach. You say, all right, well, it's windy today. But in our, I, I think when you use science though, you can say, you know what? It's a windy day. We want to have a rating system that recognizes the difference in these two boats' performance on a windy day and a light air day and a medium day. Otherwise, you'd know the results before you even left the dock. So the, the point is with more sophisticated scoring, you have the ability to, to make it more fair. Um, I, I know this is a little tough to see, but in the low wind ranges, six, eight, up to 10 knots, the far 30 uh, is faster. Does that surprise anyone? And this is a windward lured course. 
40.7 is going to be a slug in six knots of wind. A far 30 is going to be faster. Everybody accept that? I, th I think that's easy to, easy to believe. However, the curves cross over when you get above 10 knots. Now, the 40.7 is faster, right? It starts to move. It starts to put people on the rail. It's powered up. It's a longer boat. So therefore, it's going to be faster up until about 16 knots. And then what happens? They cross over again. Why? Because what does a far 30 do in 20 knots of wind? It's going to get up and go, isn't it? 40.7 does not have that same performance. So this is just a, an easy example uh, of, of how that works. Planing versus plowing. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> and I think everybody here and also on Zoom, they, this is kind of intuitive. These are common boat types and you know how they perform. Okay, what about measurement? Is that worth it? The short answer is yes. Is that because I'm a measure? Yes. <laughs> Don't laugh in the back. You've been to the seminar. Um, it, the reason it's good is because you get known data and not what's handed to you by the rating office. The rating office guys are not out to get you. They're just using a criteria that relates to what they know about that boat type. And your boat type may not conform to that. Uh, just earlier this week, in fact, Thursday, Wednesday, I measured a boat in Annapolis, very much a cruising boat, a, a Genoa Sun Odyssey 349. Um, the owner looked at the club certificate, looked at the, the, the numbers that were given to him by the rating office, and he just thought, you know, I am just not able to sail that to that around the race course. Um, I really want to get my boat measured. So I came, measured, and lo and behold, uh, GPH change was actually over nine seconds a mile different for that boat type. That's a lot. Think about how hard you'd have to fight somebody for nine seconds a mile. It's quite a bit. So that just came from a few hours of measurement. Um, so if, if you're seri at all serious about it, think about it uh, or have questions about it, contact me, contact Chris Tutmark. He's our new chief measure at U.S. Sailing. Uh, he does a fantastic job. Absolutely a whole new culture in that office at U.S. Sailing. Incredibly great team. They hired good people now. It's a fully functioning race office <laughs> uh, and they're they're knocking it out of the park. So questions about that, you know, refer to them. I'm happy to entertain questions too. Uh, criteria for ORCI certificates. I mentioned offset files. Every boat that gets an ORC certificate needs to have a three-dimensional representation of the hull and the appendages in order to run the VPP. Now, that could be a measured file. In other words, it was uh, measured back in the 80s and 90s. There was a technique called wanding. If anybody remembers that. Th yeah. So that, that cartoon you see on the left is from an old wanded file. It, it doesn't have a very great density of, uh, of stations um, to define the whole shape, but it is measured. Whereas the one on the right, is a designer file uh, that was created by the rating office based on plans from the designer. And uh, that's, I don't know, it, it, it's, a, it's a tough story, but um, the difference between what was measured uh, of this boat um, by the measure and um, what the scale weight was because our team our team at ORC uh, approves offset files. They look at these very carefully and make sure that they are 
robust, that they're accurate. And our chief measurer said, you know, we don't know anything about this thing. You know, it get me some kind of data, like a scale weight. And lo and behold, the scale weight revealed it was a 1500 kilo, 3000 pounds, over 3000 pounds difference between what the calculated displacement was based on that offset file and uh, what the scale weight was. So that was a problem. Um, it got resolved last year because the boat got uh, laser scanned. That is the modern technique now for getting hull file, uh, hull file data. Um, here in Chicago, you actually have a guy who does laser scans. I'm happy to report that. Uh, if needed, it'll be the rating office that tells you that this is needed and it certainly isn't needed for all boats. But there are a few, and, and as Ron would say, you know, in the notice of race for the Mac, uh, if your GPH is faster than 515 seconds per mile, those boats have to have ORCI certificates and therefore have to have good quality offset files. So um, that's where, where that comes in. Okay, so with a race committee faced with all these different scoring options, how do they decide what to use? Um, a brief explanation on what these options are on your certificate. Uh, some of these are pertaining to inshore racing. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time because Ron's told me not to. Uh, basically the course models you see on the left. <laughs> And, uh, and how the formulations work are on the right. This is all published on the uh, ORC page um, and scoring options. Um, if you use the triple number system, which I think has been used here, uh, the, the formulations and wind speed for low, medium, and high are shown on that uh, table on the lower, lower right. Uh, there they are on the, from the certificate in both time on time and time on distance. Um, this is the juicy part that pertains to all you Mac racers. So both Bayview and Chicago have, um, have courses, course models that have been developed over years of research and experience, uh, here in Chicago, if you don't already know it, you've got three options an all purpose option, uh, where they think the wind is coming from many different directions at many different wind speeds, uh, using that formulation you're able to distill the rating into one number. You need both, you need to cover the variables of both wind speed and direction. And the percentage matrix is shown on the upper left. Uh, for the, the, the Chicago also has an upwind model for if they believe, and you all know this, right? So it's the day before the race, you make that announcement, is what model they think is the appropriate one based on the forecast. Um, and there's the formulations there. Guess what? You know, for optimum beat and 52 degree reach, it's 34.7 uh, and 30.95 percent. Thirty-five degree reach is thirty point nine five percent, and an optimum VMG uh, run is thirty four point seven percent. So that that those are the formulations used to to get to the ratings that are shown on the table in the upper right. Time on time ratings for that boat. Um, what's new in twenty three? What did our team work on besides sleds and Cal forties? Um, we figured out how to rate, anybody ever see the flying Nika? 44 foot boat that gets up and goes on foils. Uh, a Mocha 60s do that too. So ORC now has the framework uh, to rate boats like that, that basically sail in three modes, a displacement mode in, in light air, uh, a high speed foiling mode, in, in, in heavier air and in the middle, there's kind of a gray zone where it's a semi-displacement mode. Uh, there's uh, some work that was done on the aerodynamic force coefficients for Hetzel set flying, because there were some boats that were uh, 
getting some, let's call them anomalous ratings. <laughs> uh, so there need, uh, uh, the team needed to work on those. <clears throat> so improvements to, the, uh, to that arrow model. Uh, there was also a lot of work done on the, on the hydro model that was implemented uh, about halfway this year. It will be implemented in its full extent next year. Uh, and then the ability to, um, ability to rate uh, catamarans and trimarans, multi-hulls. Mostly the demand for that has been boats like you see there, you know, gunboats and performance luxury cats. Eventually it'll probably be approached and used for, for other types of multi-hulls, but the framework is there this year. And we are really lucky to have, uh, have a member join our staff who was at World Sailing as the, as the technical director. And uh, he's an expert in multi-hulls. So we're, we're really happy and excited about that. Uh, okay, fees. For 23, I'm told by our pals at US Sailing, they're gonna be raising prices, uh, 10%. I think that's a re reflection of uh, inflation and uh, needing to keep the doors open at U.S. Sailing with three full-time employees. I don't think that's a deal breaker for most people, but and I don't have that new fee schedule table. By the way, they have they don't have that put online yet. Um, also, speed guides are going to be uh, sold, not given for twenty-three. In the past couple of years, they were given free with each certificate. Uh, now they're gonna be vended at 50% discount from the retail price, which ends up being, I think, around 25 bucks. So there'll probably be a tick box in your application for renewal, whether or not you want a speed guide. Uh, what else? Um, ORC club, sorry, ORC um, non-spinnaker and uh, double-handed certificates are now also not free with a standard certificate. They're, they're now gonna be sold at also a 50% discount. That's brand new information for me, literally a few days old. Almost, almost is the answer. I have a link for the new application. Um, if you're absolutely chomping at the bit and need to do it now, or you can wait for a few days when the announcement is made uh, through your U.S. sailing membership and other media outlets on, on what the process is. Wait for the announcement. Don't clog the pipes yet. <laughs> They're still working through. Uh, the process is improved. I'm happy to report. And it will be a thousand percent better than it was in the last two years. Uh, speed guide is shown an example on the right. That gives you polar plots of uh, your boat with all of the different sail combinations is available not just in tabular and graphic form, but also digital form. So if uh, you have Expedition or some other routing program, the output in the speed guide is available in digital format that can be inputted to those routing programs. And then target speeds uh, on the left are for those of you that do windward lured sailing and you want some upwind and downwind targets that you uh, print out and you laminate and you put them on the bulkhead in the cockpit and then your trimmers can see them and the helmsman barks at the trimmers and says, are we on target or some such thing? Anyway, but those, those are handy as well. Sailor services, I uh, mentioned this before. Um, this is the online portal for getting all of this and more information. Uh, the URL for that is really easy. It's uh, orc.org backslash sailor services. There's a free login to register for the system. And then there's instructions on how to use it. A lot of people like to run test certificates on what ifs. What if I have Andy build me an A2 that's, you know, 10 square meters larger, because I just don't feel like my boat's wicked up enough. You could, you or he can run, a, run with dimensions of the new sale, run a test certificate, see what your rating change will be, and then argue whether or not you think it's worth it. Sorry, agree on whether or not you think it's worth it. <laughs> Andy will always say yes. 
as he should. Any ORC, any ORC certificate that's in the system, the, the search criteria. The, the question was, uh, does this apply for, for any boat type? And my answer is any boat type that's in the system. And there's thousands of different boat types. So you do a search on boat type. Um, it, it, just a, a hint when you use these things, if you can find in the database an ORC I certificate for that boat type, that's gonna be better because then you're rely, you have reliable information uh, that you're getting from the database. Rating officers, it turns out, have tremendous latitude on what they can put into club certificates. So if you're using this for testing purposes, uh, try to err whenever possible on a full measured ORCI certificate. Uh, oh, look at that. There's the form. Should I advance quickly so they don't get it? Keep going. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, questions. So you had a question in the back. I'm sorry. I cut you off before. Nope. Behind you. Young lady in the white top. Oh, there we go. Yes. Another question. It wouldn't be an extrapolation. It would be the VPP. Sorry, the question was, uh, you mentioned sleds, got a really good rating bump. How do we know if that's applied to other boat types? And the answer is you run, run the certificate, run a VPP, run a test. So you can't, you can't necessarily assume. All right. It's going to run the VPP according to what the, the question is, how do we know how it's going to affect boats of a similar type? And the answer is simple. You get the measurements, the measurement data for that boat type and you run a test. If you're curious on what improvement they may have made, then you got to compare that against what they may have gotten last year and see what the Delta is. Maybe said a little differently. It's not zeroing in on a particular boat. It's not, it's not saying, okay, there's sleds. This would be a perf kind of approach. There's sleds, we need to give them credit. Uh, this is looking at specific characteristics and other boats that share that commonality and those characteristics, since that's built into the VPP, should also benefit similarly, maybe not identically, um, but boats that have those particular characteristics. Exactly. Oh, I'm sorry. He, what did he say? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. What, what what the question was? So you're refining the model, uh, or in another way, you're we're refine the whole VPP is refined. So any boat that is going to share those characteristics will similarly get a benefit. I would go so far as to say, for example, the uh, the Perry Fifty Eight would be part of that crowd, a boat that didn't show up in your on your chart, but Sagamore. Uh, the, the Nelson Merrick 68 is going to similarly benefit characteristically. So you didn't see everybody in that outlying corner and boats within the tolerance range that share those characteristics are going to get um, a, a bit of credit for those improvements in the VPP. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the benefit. It would it would likely be more characteristically close to the mostly off wind, not all purpose. Uh, if you think about all purpose, that's effectively a race around an island with a constant wind direction. 
So if, if you look at how that's bolted together, that's how that mix would work. Something that's gonna be a predominantly reaching course is going to be more, um, you know, any reaching angle from beam to broad, even, even possibly some optimum run. I don't know what they did in the Lauderdale to Key West mix, but I've done that race 12 times. And that's a, you know, reaching and offwind race. So that's kind of my guess at what they might have done. Uh, almost. We, we actually, I work with Chris Woolsey, who scored that race. Initially, they thought it was going to be a, a mostly downwind race based on the forecast. And then it turns out the wind didn't behave as, as it was thought. Imagine that. Uh, so the race was rescored using a uh, mostly upwind uh, model, and the race results were actually a little bit different, <laughs> uh, but broadly the same. There weren't many place changes. That, that's the other thing that happened. If you, if you zoom in too much on what the exact model is, you might be kind of fighting yourself because the results may actually not change. Now, you had a question about the all-purpose uh, model and in the in this slide on the upper right shows what the wind mix is for the all purpose and then as Ron said the wind angle mix for all purpose is an equal balance of all wind angles as he says sailing around an island we used to call that circular random so the reaching model is new it's on certificates this year will be on certificates this year Yeah, Mac race is locked in. Their notice of race is done. So, yeah. So if you want to change that, you got to fight with this guy. The answer is: Is the Mac race going to change, uh, change to something else? And uh, the answer I got today was: They're they're going to be on these three models. Sam. Okay. On. Okay. Yep, so anyone online who has a question, put it in the Q&A section and, uh, and we'll get to you. We have a, a good uh, a monitor for that. Yes. Six questions, whoa. Uh, okay, we call them Hetzel set flying, but same thing. We do not weigh sails. No, you said the boats. Right? Oh, no, we do not weigh boats. We don't have to because we have Archimedes. We have Archimedes. So we, we measure from a reference point. Usually it's at the shear down to the water plane. By doing that, we then know what's below the water plane and therefore can calculate displacement. Well, we, as a measure, you try to get conditions where you can measure that to within a millimeter. So yes, uh, light, light air, flat water. We do not have a model for waves. That's, sorry, the, the question is, do we have a model for waves and their influence on performance? And the short answer is no. In higher wind speeds, I think there is a wave function that is, uh, is invoked in the equations, but it's very, you, you need to remember the principle here. You need to be able to measure what effect this is, put it in an equation, and then, and then be able to try to model its performance. I, I, I rule beater is, I'm sorry, that, that's a antiquated term. I, I'm not even, I'm not even, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. So the, the, the question is, because of the unique characteristics of the lake, uh, do we have boats that are going to outperform their ratings? Is that it? Or underperform their ratings? Sea keeping science is advanced, but believe me, it's a challenge to put that into a measurement based system. 
right? That would involve a whole other set of inputs and a whole other set of equations that need to be put into the VPP. So you as a race officer in choosing the course model, you now have not just wind speed and wind direction, you may need an input on what the C state is. There is no VPP I know of that does that. Well, maybe the America's Cup, I don't know. They don't do that. No. Uh, so the is the question is why why are we starting at six knots? Uh, because it again can't be modeled. Our models rely on an, on an arrow model that assumes laminar flow. Come on, you guys have all been out there. Correct. Then then the time clock is going. If it's time on time. Yes. Let me take a there, there, there's basically, there's virtually no VPP model or rating rule that works under six knots. And you can exaggerate that on the Great Lakes because when we have uh, consistently under six knots of wind, what does it turn into? Your own little localized perimeter of micro systems. Uh, you know, are you on the beach or is the guy even a half mile out finding wind and it's a crap shoot. And there isn't a VPP out there that can model under six knots. Uh, well, I tell you what, that that's a, yeah, we got to move. What is a budget for, for rating? Do you want to be measured? Uh, okay. So if you hire me or another measure, the fee is $20 a foot. I think that's sort of the going rate of, of getting measured. Plus you'll have to pay US sailing a, a fee for their certificate. Okay. You bet. Ah, while we're on the topic of, of measuring hulls and appendages. That is an excellent question to which I don't exactly know the answer. We try to work with the guys that do the laser scanning uh, to make rates that are reasonable. Uh, the guy that I know who's the best in the business is based in Rhode Island, Andy Williams. Uh, if you get three or four boats that are going to be scanned, he could have a rate that's as low as five or 600 bucks a boat. If you want to fly them in and have them do one boat, it's going to be much more expensive than that. So there's bulk rate pricing. Question, right yes, so another you, question. Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, the largest, yes. Yep. Uh, okay, so the question is from the... Yeah. Yes. 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 No, uh, ORC will give you a rating based on what you got, right? So if you have a code zero or a Hetzel set flying and you plan to use it, then it needs to be measured and declared under the certificate. And you will... Yeah, I'll let Ron take that. <laughs> yeah. in, in the way we run the, the level classes or the one design classes in the Mac, um, 
you your rating is going the ratings among the group are going to be what we call normalized to common fastest ratings under each mix so it's really important for the fleet to manage themselves on what that according to their rule on what they will and they won't allow i intend this year to engage the the one design fleet captains much more aggressively to manage their fleets with us because it becomes an impossible task to try and ferret that out and you guys know your fleet better than we do okay very good thank you yeah th thanks ron uh so a question from uh james perry lewis i that could be perry lewis yeah <laughs> What is the rating effect of IMS type performance versus racer cruiser? So on a certificate, one of the features that you'll see on page one is, uh, is, is whether the boat type is of performance or cruiser racer. Uh, this does often have an effect on rating. And the key element there is defining what is a cruiser racer. Uh, that is actually a, an appendix in the IMS rule book. And there's a bunch of different criteria. I'm not gonna give you a laundry list of all of them, but basically it's not something that looks like it's a cruiser racer. There are specific criteria. So number of births, fixed births, uh, enclosed head, settee table, combings in the cockpit. These are just a few of the criteria that are needed to identify the boat as cruiser racer. Now, I will admit from what I've seen, there are some, um, there are some certificates out there that have been issued over the years that, that have uh, been a little lax on looking at that criteria. But SETI table, for example, uh, J111s, um, I don't think any of them in the States were sold with SETI tables. And yet many people think, oh, those guys are cruiser racers. They got fixed bursts. They have a, a head that's enclosed. They have cockpit combings, but they forget about the SETI table. And not only that, it has to be fixed. It has to be of a minimum size. Um, and the rating credit's actually pretty damn good because I work with, <laughs> work with guys in Annapolis who built one out of carbon fiber that folded, folded against the bulkhead, but could be deployed and fit the criteria for cruiser racer. Meaning not only a minimum size, but it has to be in a place where everybody on the crew can sit in the settee at that table. So uh, it may not be the spirit of the rule, but it met the letter of it. And a little bit of a follow up to that. Yes. That option uh, from James Perry Lewis, that option is not available when it's filed, correct? Well, I don't know. I'd have to look at Sailor Services. I think it is actually. There is, yes, there is. Sailor Services has a drop down where you can choose performance or cruiser racer. I, I believe that's the case. Yes, another question. Sorry. Is there age allowance built into the rule? The, the answer is uh, yes. The answer is yes. There is age allowance put in for boats. Yes. And then there's also something called dynamic allowance put in for boats that are old. No, because it's a calculation, it's, a, it's, not, a, it's not a fixed number. It appears, on the front page. It, it, it appears in the certificate and the calculation for that is based on a variety of different parameters. But yes. Well, then I, I can't because Ron doesn't want me to to show the link to the certificate application that's on the resources page. As long as people promise to not bother. <laughs> uh huh. On the internet? Yeah, yeah. Don't get excited. This, this is a jot form that will be coming soon. So don't please. <laughs> Don't hold me to it. This could change. I promise this guy could take this question. Yes. 
Oh, wait, wait a minute. One more thing. Sale measurements from the sale makers are going to be inputted now, not on certificates. They're going to be inputted by you guys. Arr. Because, think about it, transcriptional errors. Somebody misses a digit. Better it comes from you than... Yes, there will be instructions to sale makers on how to do it. Yes. No, zero. If it's left as unknown, doesn't matter. Yes. Question was, does sale material declared in the inventory of sales make any difference in rating? And the answer is no. It's, it's, a, it's a handy way to keep track because, because this is all published, you go, okay, that's our carbon main and that's our Dyneema spinnaker or something. Okay. Yes, next. The credit applies if, excuse, okay, the question relates to, is there a credit in the crew for roller furling head sale? Um, and the credit applies when you only have one head sale. In the cruising division, we allow you to declare two. Even if you have a roller furling, but you have two head sales, you don't get the RF credit. Um, they didn't do a good job in the past of asking about the number of head sales that you had declared. And I, I, I'm going to go back again and check and make sure that's one of the questions on the new application process. Uh, no, it, it, it won't. That's a that's an upper limit, but then you go to the back page and it's what you actually declare. So if you got a limitation that applies to a division in a race like we have in the Mac, then on that on that additional page, you're only going to want to have two. That's your limit, even though the allowance under ORC under the rule may allow you 15 of them. You know, it's uh, I'm, yeah. I, I just said we are going to make sure that they're including on the renewal application or on the application that you declare how many head sales so that we can avert that issue. I'm not going to repeat that particular question. I'll make comment on that. Yeah, default limits on sales are, are from the ORC rules. A notice of race can override that as it does here. So um, when certificates are issued, uh, they really should be examined. And, and U.S. Sailing, by the way, has a great process now, and they're adhering to the process, which is send out a test to everybody that gets a certificate so you can examine it ahead of time to see if it's correct, because mistakes are made. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, we've got pretty good checks and balances. Mr. Mark? Yes. They're already on there. They're on page two. Ah, okay, yes. You know why? Sorry, you got to, yes. At the bottom of, uh, when you get your test certificate, it's an HTML file. At the bottom of that space, you'll see a bunch of tabs, a bunch of buttons with three letter abbreviations for different countries. Find the USA button, push that, and then that space will populate with all the, all the USA um, uh, scoring options for your test certificates. Your actual certificates are issued by US Sailing will have that. But if you're running tests in sailor services, remember to push the USA button once you get the HTML. All right, that work? Yes. Great. Uh, 
yes, or you can make it up or, or whatever you want to do. Yeah, sale data has to, well, no, 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 running tests. No, no. make it up. <laughs> They're running tests. There's no harm, no foul. What happens in sailor services stays in sailor services, by the way. No, then you need to have real data from a credible source, such as a sale maker. <laughs> Credit, credible sale maker. He's, he's the only credible sale maker because he's here. I don't know where the others are. No, uh, I, I'm kidding. But yes, from, from, from data that's taken from a sale maker or a measurer like me. Hey, I got this sale. Can you help me get it measured? And we lay it out and we put a tape on it and we measure it. So yes, it has to be measured. Negative. The question is, can you have more than one valid certificate? The, the answer is no. You can have a non-spinnaker and a, uh, a double-handed, thank you, or a standard certificate for the same boat. But for each type, you can only have one valid. Yes, and, the, and, and you can amend an existing certificate if you want to change the configuration such as crew weight or different sales, or yeah, guess what? We switch from a, a spinnaker pole to a sprit. So, but that, that is an amendment to an existing certificate. Um, the, uh, let's see, the GL52s, those guys have an inshore mode and an offshore mode, right? We can't have both valid at the same time. And the reason for that is, pragmatism. Everybody uses the program yacht scoring. Yacht scoring, what that does is the admins go type in the certificate reference number in the back end of yacht scoring. Yacht scoring goes into the database and grabs one certificate, whatever the latest valid certificate is. If you try to tell the system that, oh, well, we have another certificate number, the, uh, the possibility of a screw up is outstandingly huge. So, uh, so that's the policy. Now, different groups uh, like the GL52s, they can work with the rating office directly and say, hey guys, we know what our configuration is for the Mac race. We know what we want for the nude. Can you keep these sort of teed up so that when we need to switch, we can do that. But then they got to argue with Ron so that Ron's scratch sheet for the Mac race, uh-oh, he's given that slashing. <laughs> we coordinated with uh, the Great Lakes 52s, for example, last year. And like anyone, they, you know, everybody has to finalize their certificate by the 15th of June. And the reason we have that deadline is we don't want people trying to game a forecast as it closes in on the race. And well, I'm gonna take a code zero and then no, I'm not because I'm not gonna have enough condition for that. And so even though the GL52s were flipping to different valid ratings and they had ratings queued up, we made them declare what they were gonna utilize by the 15th of June. So there is a certain amount of brain torture we go through with that. We're trying to be accommodative, but you know, the, the, the uh, that, that gaming the rating when you get closer on the forecast, that isn't fair to anybody. I mean, that just, that turns into an arms race and we're trying to limit that. There's already enough of an arms race. So is there any more online? Yeah, we've got one more. I'm just gonna summarize this and I think we need a little more clarification around the 75% nature spin versus pencil set line, we we'll call it, and particularly with the cruising. Uh, section. So, can a cruising section boat fly a code zero? Question, question is, can it, number one, can a cruising section boat fly a code zero? And the answer is, it's not allowed. Um, we allow up to two asymmetric spinnakers, um, but uh, head cells set flying are not allowed, the code zeros are not allowed in the cruising division. I, I'm getting hit with two at once. Yes.
was just a mention, I think, while you were talking about the list of the 52 having multiple certificates and switching them between the Yeah. Not, yeah, not I think we, I think we covered that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry, you. Our point blooms allowed is pretty protected. Code. Point blooms for some tax exempts. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Is that it? All right. All right. Thank you. That concludes our day.